The Bigot, or How I Learned to Love Donald Trump, a novel by Troy Parfit. You are listening to an audiobook sample. Legal disclaimer from the author. This is a work of fiction, therefore all characters appearing herein are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Counter disclaimer from the author. Please disregard the above disclaimer. The lawyers made me write it. This book has only been called a novel for legal reasons and because categorizing it as anything else is impossible. Please keep this in mind when weighing up the non-standard nature of its narrative arc. This novel is a Romana clay, meaning all characters have been plucked from real life. The persons herein bear a near exact resemblance to real persons, living or dead, and this is in no way a coincidence. Legal Disclaimer from Cohen, Herskovitz, and Associates Kindly disregard the author's impetuous counter-disclaimer. This genuinely is a work of fiction, therefore all characters appearing within this work's covers really are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is unequivocally coincidental, as can be empirically proven in a court of law. An intellectual? Yes, and never deny it. An intellectual is someone whose mind watches itself. I like this because I am happy to be both halves, the watcher and the watched. Can they be brought together? This is a practical question. We must get down to it. Albert Camus Man acts as though he were the shaper and master of language, while in fact language remains the master of man. Martin Heidegger Chapter 1 On the day I left for Saudi Arabia, we were hit by a magnificent blizzard. I was sitting on my brother Carl's sofa, his Chinese pug beanbag snoring on my knee, absorbing the maritime morning news. It was the usual tosh. The crack crew at Halifax's most viewed information network was covering a potluck supper being held at the Dartmouth Armory by a determined band of blue-haired ladies trying to raise $5,000 so a Mrs. Edith McCleary could travel to Miami, Florida. Was the grandmother of three visiting a long-lost relative or in need of medical treatment unavailable here in this vast and parochial one-time British dominion? No, she had just never been to the Sunshine State. The field reporter signed off by saying the fundraiser was oh so nice. The cosmetically enhanced newsreaders echoed the sentiment, and the message slipped through my brother's shaky critical defenses. Now that was a nice story. Yeah, it was, I agreed. With Carl, it was best to agree, though I seldom did. And the story really was nice. It just wasn't news. Carl and I were rather different, a fact reinforced by time spent together at Christmas with our parents and most relatives occupying frozen plots in the Atlantic View Cemetery, we decided to spend the holidays together at his place in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This entailed my flying to Halifax, Nova Scotia from Leeds in England after completing a master's degree in education. However, Carl and I spent Christmas Eve, day, and the hangover half of Boxing Day at his fiancé's house in Liverpool in Nova Scotia, an experience that proved even more awkward than passing time with Carl alone. Carl's bride-to-be, Sarah something or other, her pallid cheeks tattooed with slate teardrops, her neck ornamented with a pewter medallion etched with the contemplative phrase, J.D. and a crew kicking it, was still on probation after time served for aggravated assault. Charges stemmed from administering some rough justice to her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend outside Liverpool's infamous Plebland pub. The Crown might have shown the cognitively challenged and socioeconomically deprived Liverpudlian a modicum of leniency had she not informed the judge that should she chance upon her victim again, she'd be sure to, quote, kick that man-stealing whore right in the fucking quiff-like. Her probation was set at two years albeit with terms that allowed for a continuance of night shifts stocking shelves at the Liverpool Happy Mart. Despite Sarah's modest social standing, she possessed a glut of lofty biases which I suffered in muted politeness. 
For instance, she deemed people who smoked cigarettes and rode snowmobiles scum who gave Liverpool a bad name. She puffed on Royal Canadian Extra Strong's mind, so she had no qualms about the consumption of tobacco per se. I've been on the unfiltered since grade seven, right? But inhaling burning leaves while tearing through powdery drifts on an Ice Cat XRS 750? Well, the lady had her limits. With Sarah, communication was strained. Ditto with Carl, with whom I drew on the assistance of Canada's unofficial national discourse, alcohol-infused hockey banter. As a Christmas gift, I bought Carl a bottle of Screech, dark Newfoundland rum, and a goal light from Canadian Tire that connected to his television. The light ran off an app that caused it to flash and wail whenever his favorite NHL team, the Boston Bruins, potted the puck in the enemy's goal. Carl adored this present, but then how couldn't he? It was new, tacky, and entirely unnecessary. My brother was gainfully employed at Buchanan's Brewery, maker of Buchanan's India Pale Ale, the motto of which was Perservicia Veritas, or through beer, truth. Over the years, Carl had imbibed cosmic volumes of truth. Undeniably, he was brimful with the stuff. In Keatsian terms, you could say that beer was truth and truth beer. That was all Carl knew on Earth and all he needed to know. Well, in fairness, he also knew he could boost his image by lying. For instance, he liked to tell his pals that he had job security because at a company barbecue he had videotaped the brewery's aging male owner fondling a young female intern in the back of a company car. However, Carl really had job security because he belonged to a union. For Carl, life was simple because he was simple. In summer, he umpired women's softball games, which he found stimulating, given that he got to appraise lots of different sets of jugs. And in winter, he played on his company's hockey squad in the Dartmouth <clears throat> Gentlemen's League. Donning number 69 and leading the league in penalty minutes, more image boosting, Carl was the third line center for the Buchanan's IPA Ice Holes. The nippy season also saw him take vacations within walled resorts in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, whereupon he returned to Nova Scotia with basketfuls of Homeric yarns spun around sightings of unpackaged chickens. They walk around on people's lawns like unusual door frames, they're right freaking small like, and all the exotic people he'd met, all the way from Edmonton like. As you may have gleaned, Carl's education was sketchy. At Dartmouth Senior High School, he graduated 387th out of 396. At Dartmouth Community College, he got caught trying to nick a vending machine. He'd scotch-taped a fake handwritten receipt to the plexiglass veneer and used a trolley to wheel the thing out, informing security it was a purchase. He was swiftly expelled and received 120 hours of community service. Unsuccessfully, Carl sought to have his sentence reduced by telling the court he was patriotic and singing God Save the Queen. In addition to being musical, Carl was literate and took up the occasional book, usually penny-dreadful paperbacks with opening lines like, Rex Steele bolted awake in a strange cold room and wondered, Where the hell am I? As for nonfiction, the only monographs I'd seen Carl dip into were the King James Version and Mein Kampf, texts that, to employ the maritime vernacular, rested in a drawer in his bedside table, side by each. Carl was a closet Christian and an extremely amateur historian obsessed with the Third Reich. Truly, he hadn't been as hard on the Fuhrer as most historians. As he saw it, history had been written by liberal do-gooders, and Hitler had some pretty good ideas. The only periodicals my brother perused were the Hockey News and High Times, editions of which he kept with his prose collection in a rack by the toilet. Nevertheless, by 60, Carl would have a tremendous pension and money in the bank. I, by contrast, had three university degrees, a BA, BED, and an MED, spoke good French and German, along with middling Japanese and decent Mandarin, but unless I started battening down my financial hatches, 
I'd likely wind up cohabitating with Carl as his cellar dweller, hence my decision to teach English in Saudi Arabia. A committed democratic socialist and neo-Marxist, I disdained money. But, well, we all swam in the same waters, didn't we? I suppose I also wanted to give myself a challenge. Studying in the UK had made me even more liberal, had shuttled my views from center-left to far-left, but Saudi Arabia was one of the most conservative contexts on Earth. They say returning to the real world after immersion in the academic realm can be vexing. So why not make it positively jarring? Anything thereafter would seem peaches. Diagonal in his corduroy recliner, Carl fingered his phone and grunted. Flight's still running. Of course it's still running, I replied. Now we're just getting a few flurries. The blizzard won't hit until later. Cancellations shouldn't begin until late afternoon or early evening. My sibling and I shared one of our ritual prickly silences. Then Carl lifted the remote and shunted to one of his favorite channels, 24-7 Family Feud. Reading from a card, the host bellowed, Name a popular activity that begins with the letter B. The Sullivans had no trouble sussing out the first five, baseball, basketball, bicycling, barbecuing, and baking. However, they struggled with the final answer, so Carl counseled them. Badminton. It's badminton. Oh, for the love of badminton, jeez, they're some friggin' dumb, aren't they? The final response was indeed badminton. The poor Sullivans, if only they had listened. My brother sighed. Well, I'd better take old Beanbag out before we go. You got everything ready? You know I'm always ready. Ha, <laughs> yeah, right. Any creative writing course will tell you, prescriptively, to relegate banal conversation to the cutting room floor. But banal conversation was the only sort my brother and I had. As for eliminating cliches, that was impossible. Our entire relationship was a cliché. Carl peed Beaner and disappeared inside his garage. His redneck mobile, the one-ton gas-guzzling pickup, the Utah Tuffy, Patriotically upgraded to the Great White North edition for a scant thirteen ninety five ninety five, and bumper stickered with the image of a lamb and the phrase, there's a place for all God's creatures, right next to the mashed potatoes, was being repaired after a fender bender. To Carl's discomfiture, the only vehicle he could obtain from the rental outfit sanctioned by his insurance company was a cheap Chinese car called the Dongda Ordeal. I forced my luggage into the ordeal's trunk, started the engine, and blasted the heat. After a moment, I honked the horn, but Carl failed to emerge from his man cave. I ventured inside to find him in front of a Confederate flag he'd stapled to the plywood walls, his messy blonde hair haloed in hash smoke, his puffer fish lips suctioned to a can of Dartmouth orange pop, his right hand clutching three darts. My brother had been getting in some practice with ye old numbered board. Wouldn't want to let Chris Fucker Boudreaux or Marcus Bitch Tit Smith out toss him in the warmer months, no siree Bob. Carl Klein, brother of Max Klein, that'd be me, was this working class neighborhood's champion tosser. You smoke a joint before you take me to the airport? In this weather? In that shitbox? Carl belched. Fucking right. Why drink and drive when you can smoke and fly? What are you, a teenager or something? Hey, bud, I'm the one with the steady job. Ouch. Carl piloted the ordeal through a galaxy of snowflakes as the bristles of winter's paintbrush daubed the landscape a frothy white. After turning the dial to a country music station, he began tapping the steering wheel to a twangy refrain from a cowgirl who couldn't get no action while her tractor couldn't get no traction. Can we please listen to the CBC? What for? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps we'll hear something intelligent. Pfft, intelligent. Attention, Canadians. The world's in deep shit. No, we ain't listening to your pinko commie queer CBC, Max. No Canadian bumfucking corporation for me, merci beaucoup. And don't go getting no ideas about touching that there dial or I'll bust your fucking knuckles. Carl, the B stands for broadcasting, and there's a program I want to listen to. 
part two of a series about Swedish socialism and its influence on architecture and contemporary design. I know the B stands for broadcasting, and I repeat, you touch that there dial and I'll bust your fucking knuckles. Come on, Carl, I genuinely want to hear it, okay? I was listening to part one yesterday. Fuck you, Brainiac. Well, it's reassuring to see marijuana's analgesic effects. Analgesis effects? No, not... It's polysyllabic, Carl. Several furlongs beyond your paltry field of comprehension. Oh, fuck off. Do you even know what polysyllabic means? I don't know. Something about a parrot? Poly is Greek for many. Oh, yeah? Well, in that case, you can poly fuck right off. Carl, may I ask you something serious? What? Is, um, Sarah gaining weight? You know she ain't small, bud. Yeah, but it looks like she's pregnant. She isn't, is she? Of course she ain't. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I mean, I should know, right? I'm down her place in Liverpool twice a month, giving her the business like. Or she's up here. Well, whenever she can sneak away from her parole officer. And how often is that? Well, uh, come to think of her, bud, not all that often. Last time was when? Shit, back in August, I think, when I had that end of summer party out in the yard there, the night I won 48 bucks playing washer toss. And that night, and don't you ever fucking repeat this, that night I didn't give her the business because I was too drunk to get it up. Heck, everyone was drunk that night. Marcus, Chris, even Beanbag. And oh my God, you should have saw Eddie from next door, eh? He was so loaded, his wife Nancy wouldn't let him in the frickin' house. So I had to let him crash in the basement. He was right fucking out of her, he was. Fucking staggering around and blabbering. He was, like, right incorrehensible. You couldn't make out a word he was saying. You missed a good time that night, bud. Over there in a fucking library in jolly old England being a fucking nerd. I'm sure it was the social event of the season, Carl. You probably took out an ad in the auto trader. It was fucking awesome, and you weren't there, okay? Jesus, look at this old bitch going here, would ya? Fucking old cunt couldn't drive her thumb up her ass. The new she got with her in the passenger seat. Hippie granddaughter is what it looks like. Fucking white girl wearing dreadlocks. Now that's fucked up. She's kind of cute, though, but she's probably a carpet shark. Yeah, she looks like a rug muncher. Fucking whore. She was probably straight till some bulldog dyke professor at Fags R Us University told her screwing women would help make society equivalent. And who's this here behind us? A family of fucking chinkies? Shit, their fucking relatives probably built this hunk of junk. Christ, I hope no one sees me driving this thing. Hey, I know. I'll slow down and let them pass, and then I'll roll the window down so you can talk to them in your fucking Ching Chong Chinaman language. Wing wing chong chong. Tell him you want the lunch special number two, cream of some young guy. No, I know. Ask him, how long is a Chinese name? Get it? How long is a Chinese name? Get it? You get it, bud? Do you get it or not? You want to talk to him, bud? I'll roll her down for you. I'll roll her down for you right fucking now. On second thought, better not. If I do roll her down, this fucking shit wagon's liable to turn into a slanty-eyed ninja kite. Fucking state troopers will find us up some fucking spruce tree in fucking Maine. How do you know they're not Malaysian or Korean? What? The people behind us. The fuck's a difference? Carl, honestly, on your ocean of racism and hate, what should be a beckoning shoreline is really just another wave. In English, you're a bigot, not to mention a complete idiot and an arsehole. That ain't true, bud. You ask any of the guys at work, except for fucking Rod Cornwall, or Rod Cornhole, as I like to call him, and they'll tall you. I'm smart as a wit. And why don't you like Rod Cornwall? Cause he's a dick. Be specific. Ah, uh, you know, he's always telling jokes that ain't funny and stuff, and he's always laughing at me. What kind of jokes? I don't know, stupid jokes. Give me an example. Oh, all right. What was it, a couple weeks ago there, he told me one about breakfast cereal. He said, what did the blonde say when she opened the box of Cheerios? So I says, I don't know, Rod, what did she say? And he says to me, he says, wow, donut seeds. Then he starts laughing and walks away. Now I ask you, is that joke funny? It doesn't even make any sense. And if I can't get it, it's liable no one at Buchanan's can get it, because like I told you, I'm probably the smartest guy there, like. Smart? 
Carl, of all the problems in this world, of all the graft and sleaze and corruption on this pathetic plane of oppression and fraud, with venal politicians colluding with crass capitalists at every turn to gum up the works and rake it in for themselves, which, I'll have you know, happens at your and nearly everyone else's expense, and what really boils your bottom? What truly gets your knickers in a twist? After Carl Klein has surveyed this dim and embittered orb with its war wounds and poverty and starving children, who holds top spots on the who's to blame list? Vegetarians and Phil Collins. Oh, I fucking hate Phil Collins. That dipshit ought to be banned. Right. So not environmental toxins ought to be banned, or union busting, or mass surveillance, or nuclear proliferation, or selling girls into prostitution, but in the air tonight. Well, no, there's that other one there. Susudio. Yeah, well, I just don't deem that to be a sign of intelligence. Oh, yeah? Well, that's cause I call it like I see it. I'm one of the real people, not one of them there fancy-pants fruitcakes with a PhD that lectures on why it's so goddamn brave for a man to show up at a shift at the mill wearing a fucking dress. I mean, here we just got finished fighting a war against the towel heads to try to teach their girls how to read and shit, right? Canadian heroes over there are putting their lives on the line so them fucking dirtbags could have good things like Hockey Night in Canada and Tim Horton's coffee. But did the Jewish Marxist media call that brave? Hell no. But when some homo identifies as Cinderella, all them left-wing jerk-offs stand up and applaud. And you, you go right along with them. Okay, look, if we can't listen to the CBC, can we at least listen to classic rock? This hillbilly dribble is giving me a headache. Yeah, yeah, but if they fucking play Lola, I'm switching her back. A car overtook us, and Carl had a good gawp at the driver. Something he saw intrigued him, so we sped up until we were level with the passing vehicle. Fuck me, they're coming out of the wormwood today, bud. Look at the fucking mug on that guy. Christ, that's a 12-inch thick crust with extra pepperoni. Talk about craters. Looks like the moon through a telescope. He kept waiting for Carl to relent, to realize he was thick and horrible and needed to improve and humanize, but he wouldn't. He couldn't. This was how he'd always been, and this was how he'd always be. All dense, all the time. At the moment of conception, his programming had been permanently set to brutish, heartless, and stupid. In Carl's case, our parents had only correctly chosen one of six numbers in the psychical genetic lottery and he hadn't evolved through education, instead branding his school days dumb. Now here he was, driving high, making racist remarks, picking his nose and flinging pellets of snot on the floor. As I glared at him in disgust, his fish lips began to quiver. Beauty of a rental. You don't have to keep her clean. And I ain't violating the contract, neither. She'll come under normal wear and tear. You're repugnant. What? You're disgusting. That's not disgusting. Carl smeared some nose slime across the ceiling. This is disgusting. Hey, someone's got to clean it. I'm keeping somebody in a job. Yeah, you're a regular good Samaritan. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Hey, what's the name of this town you're going to again? Shazam. Shazam? Ha! No friggin' way! How many people in it? A hundred thousand. It's a coastal city on the Red Sea. Well, at least it's near the water. Maybe they got lobster rolls. And what's the name of the company? It's not a company, it's a college. Chippewa College. And the contract's for a year? Yes. Yeah, right, you won't last four friggin' months. You'll be calling me in March all whiny-like, saying, Please, Carl, can I stay in your basement just till summer? Please, I won't say nothing about your jailbird girlfriend or those crappy books you read. Please, please. I don't think so. It's a Canadian college, remember, from Toronto, so it shouldn't be too bad. From Toronto? Toronto? Fuck me, silly, you'll be back in two months. You think you'll last working for some pudwack from Toronto? Max, they're like fucking Americans. So are your Boston Bruins. That's different. With the Bruins, it's about honor. Oh, Carl, would you give it up? I was unsure why I endorsed a college because it was Canadian. Every Canadian organization I'd ever worked for had been appalling. As Carl and I passed between two snowbanks and entered the Halifax airport parking lot, 
my brother noticed a car with Pennsylvania plates and the bumper sticker, Trump for President. He gave a couple of blasts on the horn along with a thumbs up, even though the car had no occupants. Carl then let me out at the departure's door before parking the ordeal and seeing me off. I entrusted him with my winter coat, suggested he was a cretin, said that Trump was a dunce, and informed him that his Boston Bruins were a disgrace to the National Hockey League. Not as big a disgrace as that girl you brung home from fucking Tony's Donaire that time. Remember her? Holy fuck, Max, you would have been better off shagging a half-dead grizzly bear. That fucking thing fell out of the ugly tree and, and hit every branch on the way down. Yeah, I know, Carl, you say that all the time. Wasn't one of your best moments, bud. Your best moment, girl-wise, was that dainty little Italian bitch you dated for a while. Remember her? Fucking Maria Mussolini or whatever. Ooh-wee, did she have a nice ass. Used to wear them tight jeans. Do you remember them? Didn't do too much for the imagination. You must have had a great old time with her. God, that ass. I would have eaten the peanuts right out of her shit, and I don't even like peanuts. An elderly couple who overheard this looked mortified. Folding my arms, I appraised my brother, who glanced around oblivious to my disapproval and much else. With his Team Canada toque hiding most of his hair and his puffy cheeks russet from the cold, Carl took out his phone to research the latest in NHL player trades. Imbecile. Yokel. Misogynist. Sexist. Conservative. Doorknob. Bigot. After my flight's boarding announcement, I gave him a hug and told him I loved him, which was absolutely true. The blizzard intensified, but the Air Canada flight from Halifax to Toronto departed on time. So did the one from Toronto to Frankfurt. Touching down in Frankfurt marked only my second visit to Germany. The first was in 1985, to Hamburg, to visit relatives now deceased. On the Lufthansa flight to Riyadh, Passengers sipped their beer and wanted to know when we'd be approaching Saudi airspace, or, more precisely, when the booze would be locked in a metal box as instructed by Allah. As we neared our destination, the mood darkened, the alcohol vanished, and women donned their niqabs. The pilot was chuffed about shaving time off the itinerary, but his effervescence quickly evaporated. It took 90 minutes to ready a gate, while rolling toward the gate, the plane got cut off and almost hit by a service vehicle. In the gate hallway, a Saudi man sitting behind a table was moodily checking everyone's passport photo against mug shots from a thumb-smudged book. He was positioned beside three clones who appeared to be on break. Two of the clones giggled and arm-wrestled while the third hollered irritably into his phone. The book contained perhaps 200 photos of Middle Eastern men, a third of whom had been crossed out with red X's. Yet the checker looked for matches with everyone, including a Korean businessman. Aged 39, I had blonde hair, a matching beard, and green eyes. But the checker found a picture of a man who looked like a Middle Eastern edition of me, only with irate irises and a large, angular nose. The checker beamed at the resemblance and looked up to see if I noticed. Hello? Answering in Arabic, the man used a crooked finger to stab at the wanted man's likeness and then point at me. Cackling, he drew his hand across his throat. Upon seeing this, the arm wrestlers howled. The guy who was yelling into his phone stood up, stuck a finger in his ear, turned his back on us, and yelled louder. The checker's strange laugh muted into a childlike smile, and he waved me on. At customs, edgy soldiers in spinach uniforms barked at people to get in queues. If you were part of a family, you got a fast queue. If you weren't, you got a slow queue. The customs agent I got spoke to me mostly in Arabic. He gruffly instructed me on how to use the fingerprint machine, whereupon he took my picture. Okay, finish. Finish you. Go. Fatigued, I tripped over a vacuum cleaner cord and couldn't figure out where to catch my 5.45 a.m. flight to Shazam. Employees at the information kiosk ignored me. They also ignored a Frenchman who shouted at them until they picked up their tees and shuffled into an office to hide. I only got correct information after asking six people. Even buying food in the airport was challenging. The only open eatery was a falafel joint, 
and while I waited in line, customers jumped ahead of me as though I were invisible. And exchanging money at the Arab National Bank was futile. A Saudi man was depositing a suitcase of 500 rial bills, each worth about $133, which the sole teller had to count by hand. The teller put up a sign. Finish. Go home. The other banks were closed. On the flight to Shazam, passengers protested against sitting in their assigned seats, and one woman objected to sitting next to me. Were the flight attendants Saudi? I couldn't tell, but the female attendants' faces were exposed, so I guessed not. Later, I realized they couldn't have been Saudi, because they were working. Riyadh's false dawn was embellished by myriad pinpricks of man-made light but the capital was soon replaced by a sand-and-sky horizon blooming with bouquets of violet melted by a honeyed sunrise. An explanation for this splendor was supplied by a television screen. Allah created everything. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. The TV screen had a Mecca compass, and at prayer time, robed men shuffled toward it to supplicate. I was so tired I began to hallucinate. When the landing gear touched down, everybody sprang out of their seats and the flight attendants couldn't make them sit. The crew was equally ineffective at persuading two men to stop shoving one another. Shazam's airport was a cubed blot of custard slashed by windows of dark chocolate. A banner above its entrance read, Welcome come Shazam, making you different. An employee from Chippewa College Shazam named Paul Gaston was supposed to collect me. I assumed he was French-Canadian, but the man who asked, Are you Max? was clearly Midwest American. He wore jeans, a t-shirt labeled the Cleveland Browns, and a ball cap that said Olson's Ice Cream. Yes, I'm Max. Hiya, I'm Rupert. Carts are over there. Grab one and follow me. I'll give you a lift to the compound. I thought I was being picked up by Paul. Yeah, he had to fly back to Canada for business. No blizzard here. The sky was a dome of Christmas light blue. The air, oven warm. Palm trees buffered the airport's frontage, as did flower pots that doubled as rubbish bins. We began driving, but soon halted for an accident. Their shoes crunching on shards of shattered taillight casings, two men faced off on the road's shoulder their signaling limbs becoming busy with a manual of harsh semaphores. Ooh, said Rupert. Look at that. Should take a picture for the fellas at work. Actually, this happens all the time here. Traffic all over Saudi's bad, but here in Shazam, it's terrible. Do not walk here. If you need to go somewhere, call a cab. Or if I'm around, because I'm the super at your compound, Compound W, ask me for a lift. Because these people will hit you and they will leave you for dead. They don't care. Saudis just don't care. I've been here for three years and thank God I haven't been in an accident. But I know teachers who have. Dean Watt, who taught here before and he's going to teach here again. In fact, he's taking the apartment across from yours. He got in an accident here and man, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. There's no rules. There's just no friggin' rules. Right, I responded and squinted out the window. First impressions? Looks like a war zone. Yeah, it ain't pretty. But hey, that Shazam. Oh, before I take you to the compound, I want to go to Baboon, or Hyper Baboon. That's the big grocery store here. Baboon? Yeah, I know. Funny name. From Pakistan or somewhere. In the mall, there's a basic Baboon. That's where teachers get groceries every Wednesday. Bus takes them from the college and then to their compound. First compound W, then compound Y. And then there's Hyper Baboon, where I'm going now, which has a better selection. There used to be a Super Baboon, the best of the three, but it burned down. Arson, one of their own, a baker from Yemen who wasn't being paid or something. The manager, some Egyptian dude, got something on him, like found out something he did wrong and made him a slave, you know. If you say anything, I'll tell the police. So this Yemeni hombre burned the place down. No one died, though. He did it on a Friday morning. They hung him over by the big mosque near our compound and left his body dangling for, oh, must have been a week. Or I should say they cut his head off, put his head in his hands, like in front of his stomach, so he was holding his own head, basically, 
and then they put his body in a cage and raised it with a crane. Ultimately, they left him on display for about seven days along with a sign saying, God's butcher is better than God's baker or some crap like that. My students told me about it. I don't speak Arabic, so I don't... Oh, shit! We just missed slamming into a boy on a bicycle. He'd zipped out of an alley straight into our path. See what I mean? They just don't care. See how he didn't even look for traffic? Man, that was close. That kid was black, I said in spite of myself. Yeah, and he was very nearly black and red. Probably Somali. Lots of Somalis here. Yemenis, too. So, um, do they hang people here often? I asked as we parked in front of Hyper Baboon. No, not too often. Coming in? Hyper Baboon was bleak, most of its food processed. I followed Rupert around as he shopped. When he got into the cash queue and began fingering chocolate bars, I returned to his unlocked car. Nodding off instantly, I snapped to when a phone rang in the glove box. I retrieved the phone and a small flask, which I uncapped and sniffed. Whiskey. The ringing ceased, and I returned the items to their places. Rupert returned. Just want to go to McDonald's before I take you to the compound. Your phone was ringing. Thanks, I'll check it later. McDonald's is getting a new kind of ice cream today, and I gotta try it. Place is staffed by Filipinos. Saudis don't work, or don't want to work, or think they're too good to work, or just plain can't work. That's part of the reason you're here, to teach them English so they can get through the English program and then get over to where I work, teaching math and the electrical and mechanical programs. I'm a compound super, but I also teach math. So it's my job to get them through that so they can get their engineering certificates and get their lazy asses out the door and into the workforce. That way, the government doesn't have to keep hiring us Americans to do everything for them. Yeah, sodization. Exactly. Companies here are mandated to hire a certain percentage of locals, but as it is, they don't have the skills. Yeah, so there's massive unemployment, especially with people under 30. You want to believe it? Lord above, this whole province is unemployed. You see, the main problem is, while Rupert expounded on Saudi Arabia's labor concerns, I gawped at the town I had just moved to. I had trouble reconciling the imagery with the photos provided by Chippewa College and learned later that many of those pictures had been taken in Jeddah. Here in Shazam, about half the houses and apartment blocks were unfinished and most construction projects had been abandoned. Completed homes were rudimentary. Cinder blocks painted beige or occasionally yellow. All buildings, finished or not, jutted like islets out of roasted plateaus of dirt stained by sea salt and speckled with detritus. The litter was astonishingly thick. It wandered everywhere, gathered in ditches, and huddled about foundations in large, jagged heaps. Compound W resembled a medium-security Guatemalan prison. It stood opposite a derelict airstrip that skewered a forsaken airfield marked by debris, weeds, cairns, emaciated dogs, collapsed watchtowers, crumbling bunkers, a crashed helicopter, and a downed space shuttle. The airfield was bound by potholed service roads and raggedy barbed wire fencing. Is that a space shuttle? <laughs> yeah, that's the rocket or Compound X, as we like to call it. Just a little joke. It's not really Compound X. They bulldozed Compound X a couple of years ago because of structural damage and pests. But is it a real space shuttle? I think so. What's it doing there? Looks like it crashed there, wouldn't you say? That airfield belongs to the military. There's a functional airfield over that way, see? But this one here is defunct. My students told me it's the designated crash zone, so if you have to crash, do it here. Wouldn't surprise me. Here, let me help you with your bags. As intimated, this wasn't my first trip outside the West. I'd lived in Hokkaido, Japan, in rural but welcoming conditions for six years, and downtown Singapore in sanitized but xenophobic ones for seven. I'd traveled through East Asia on a shoestring budget and had seen my fair share of grime. I'd found half a spider in my rice in Vientiane and had heard scampering rats in my hotel room ceiling in Hanoi. I'd also been to Dubai for an English teaching conference, so I was mildly acquainted with the Middle East. Regardless, I found my new home horrendous. 
The stairwell had been browned by dirt and doused in cat urine. The apartment was grotty, and the living room a miracle of interior design. Orange caulking, meant to close gaps between the air conditioner and the wall, had wound up everywhere besides the gaps in a pattern best described as psychedelic barf. On a wall free of this puke, a follower of Pythagoras had performed hundreds of math equations. On a third wall, the mathematician had branched out into satirical art, scrawling Shazam sucks donkey nuts and drawing a man with bulging eyes gleefully licking a mule's balls. On the brown door of a spare bedroom, the polymath had spray-painted a neon green happy face lanced by an arrow. The bathroom reeked of paint thinner and virtually every horizontal surface was covered in sand. Nevertheless, the place came with a new bed and fresh bedding. Also, Rupert cheerfully handed me a welcome pack of sundries. So what do you think? Um, should I ask you to take me back to the airport? What do you mean? What I mean is, it's a horror show. It's been months since this place has seen the likes of a broom. When was the last time anyone was even in here? I don't know. Rupert suddenly appeared anxious. I reinspected the bathroom. Nice. Dead cockroaches behind the toilet. Why didn't anyone clean this place? It is what it is, dude. It's the standard issue. The standard what? Have I just joined the army? Is your place like this? Mine? Uh, no. So only some places are like this. Well, they vary. If they vary, why did you just say it was the standard issue? I don't know. Rupert made his way to the door. Where are you going? I gotta go to, um, work. You don't start until tomorrow, so you can just sleep or whatever. Great, I said, mostly to myself. Rupert shouted up to me as he descended the filthy stairs. I'll be back this afternoon to check on you. Oh, don't drink the water. Don't even brush your teeth with it. After flushing the cockroaches, I paced around moodily, lay cautiously, reluctantly on the bed, and my new world went black. Chapter 2 On my first bus ride to Chippewa College Shazam, my liquid assessment of the town as a war zone began to congeal, although I equivocated between war zone and garbage dump. Except for a few sandy patches and places where hillocks of trash climbed above salt-smeared soil lots or stood like harried sentinels between scrap-girded concrete cubes, the desert was uniformly flecked with rubbish. Sidewalks emitted shoots and curly cues of rebar, and even the primary commercial artery appeared to have been strafed in an air raid. Vehicles were typically two or three decades old, and many were 1970s station wagons. One station wagon had a roof made of plywood. Another featured, in the place of headlights, flashlights. Rear windows were often decaled with the Shahada, which claimed, There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Shazammers drove as if they had made an appointment with God and were running behind schedule. An owlish teacher with feathery white hair and horn-rimmed glasses introduced himself as Bartholomew Lewis before playing tour guide. You're from Halifax? I'm from Montreal. That shop on the corner there actually has pet food if you're into cats. I have three. The street here is Main Street, I guess you'd call it, and um, that's pretty well it. The Red Sea is that way, the mall's behind us, and the airport's over there. Along a shambolic stretch of vulgar business facades, Men in white bought takeaway breakfasts from kebab shops while women in black crouched on the malformed footpath and begged for change. Our driver also wore white, a cap and thobe, the linen-like national costume. In one hand was a phone, in the other a stick he used for scraping his teeth. As per instructions from Toronto, I was to report to the college's director, Dr. Sterling Love. I found him in the ESL building, grinning at the incoming teachers and glancing at his watch. He beamed at me, extended a hand, and politely introduced himself. Sounds like love. It's Bulgarian. Sterling seemed chipper, but different from what I had expected. 
completely bald, terribly gap-toothed, intensely tanned, and with a handlebar mustache, he sported a dangly earring and a crisp white dress shirt revealing too much chest hair. His pants were also white and practically painted on. His footwear was glossy black and pointy-toed, the type of shoes Carl would have branded fruit boots. Sterling told me I would begin my orientation as soon as these pesky teachers got to class. Then he clapped and yelled as if a movie director. Places, everyone, places. Come on, teachers, what are we paying you for? Go to class, go to class. One teacher stopped and glowered. We're not performing a play here, Sterling. The driver was late. He's always late. Is there something difficult about leaving the compound at 7.15 and returning at 4? He's got two things to remember, and he can't even... The driver wasn't late if he got you here at 7.55, Bradley. According to you, Sterling, we're supposed to be in class by 7.55. And if we're not, it's our fault, not the bus driver's fault. Look, Bradley, despite what you may think, I'm in charge here, and I... Oh, you're in charge here, are you? We've all been wondering who that was. Well, if you're in charge, Sterling, then make an executive decision and fire the goddamn bus driver. A pulse of anger flitted across Sterling's face, and he and Bradley locked sockets. Unaware of this staring contest, another teacher appeared. Morning, Sterling. Bus broke down about a kilometer from the main entrance. Had to walk, and Conway almost got run over by a cement mixer. Heard the other bus was late. Sterling's dour rictus was shattered by a keyboard grin. Cedric, good morning. Thank you. I'll be sure to have a word with the drivers. Bradley fumed. Oh, you listen to him, but not to me. Why is that, Sterling? Why is that? Bradley's eyes found mine, and he shook his head. Sterling beckoned. Come, Max, to my office. You won't be teaching today, but I might have you observe. I thought I was going to have an orientation. It doesn't matter. I took a seat in Sterling's office, and behind me he closed the door. So, you think Shazam looks like a war zone? He allowed this remark to settle in before entering my view and occupying his chair. Picking up a paperclip, he bent it in half. Chipper no more. Well, it's not very pretty. It may not be Cape Breton or wherever, but it doesn't look like a war zone. I'm from Halifax. I don't care where you're from. Right. It doesn't look like a war zone. You have been listening to an audiobook sample of The Bigot, or How I Learned to Love Donald Trump. Click the link below to go to Amazon.com and read a sample of the print or Kindle editions of the book by using the Look Inside feature. Thank you for listening.